The Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement is a global campaign against Israeli apartheid to demand that Israel comply with international law and Palestinian rights. The following speakers discuss the significance of the BDS movement. I constructed my talk in the same way that I construct a poem. Now, we don't know if that's a good or a bad thing yet, but essentially I'm gonna talk about cultural boycott from, um, from the position of a Palestinian artist and an activist. And I think from the outset it's important to say, in, especially from my perspective, is that we should be less concerned with hurting the feelings of the oppressor and more concerned with standing in solidarity with the oppressed. And especially in the case of cultural boycott, it's about how we can engage, how we can actually act. It's not that we're going to a fund and we're trying to necessarily divest from it, but we're talking about how we can use our own time and action to, uh, to support it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how, how I think it's different and how I think um, it's effective. Um, I became a poet after 9-11. I became a poet, I was writing about Middle East politics and I felt like, there was a void, there was you know, 1.4 billion Muslims in New York City were being, uh, or, or were being mischaracterized in New York City. Uh, you had the Arab populations, that there was widespread discrimination. And I wanted, I wanted an effective medium to combat those kind of stereotypes. And especially as a Palestinian, there was a lot of talk about you guys are terrorists and this is, you know, you're crazy and you're brown and you're animals. Um, and essentially, I, I became a poet because I saw other poets. So I understand the power and the effectiveness of poetry. But when, you're, when your poetry or your art is used to service occupation, when it's used to normalize occupation, when it's used to rebrand apartheid, I think that you not only have an obligation uh, as an artist, but with any person of moral clarity, you should be standing against those actions. Um, the truth is, is no, no dialogue, cultural or otherwise, can exist under these conditions. Not as 1.5 million Palestinians are cut off in an open air prison, not as medical supplies, aid supplies, water sanitation supplies, and human bodies are denied entry into Gaza. Um, not as Palestinian cultural artists from the West Bank are denied exit. How many stories have we heard of artist after artist trying to get an exit visa, trying to get an exit pass to go share their craft with the world, world, and not just their craft, but engage in their own livelihood? You know, it, when we look at all the cultural institutions inside of Israel, they are making their living, they are paying their rent through this medium. But Palestinians in the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem, and even 48 Palestine, as they're denied visa, as they're delayed visas, aren't afforded that same kind of right. So, so often we look at how this hurts the Israeli cultural institutions who don't stand against the occupation, who don't stand against apartheid, and very rarely look at what it does to the Palestine arts community. When we talk about cultural boycott, it's important to note that it is institutional. It is not aimed at individuals. Frequently, Israelis travel the world and they're able to go um, and speak a number of them, luckily, against uh, their system of apartheid and occupation, a number of them for the right of return, a number of them for the quality for Palestinians living inside of the state of Israel. But we need some kind of action. Um, the notion that I'm gonna go and perform in Tel Aviv tomorrow and my poem in some stadium, aside from the fact that poetry is not the most popular medium, but my poem, let's say, is gonna reverberate through Israeli society and it's gonna change the internal Israeli psyche and from the river to the sea there's gonna be freedom, democracy, and equality is absolutely ridiculous. Um, it's, the reality is, is that Israelis aren't gonna look inward. They aren't gonna shift their power structure. They don't wanna give up. They're not gonna hold up the mirror to themselves. What we need is a global system of pressure on the state of Israel for that society that says, you know what, you're acting against international law. And there are three basic demands, which all fall in line with international law. The right of return, equality for Palestinians living in Israel, and the end of occupation for Arab lands. That is pretty simple, it's straightforward, it's easy. And what is good about the cultural boycott movement and BDS generally is that it is effective, it is smart, it is strategic, it is nonviolent. And as a Palestinian and as a human being, I don't want to hug a segregationist. 
I don't want to wave to you at the separate water fountain, and I don't want to appeal to you from the back of the bus. <laughs> this is not a case of two sides with equal grievances. This is occupier and occupied. This is oppressor and oppressed. This is those implementing a system of apartheid and those living under a system of apartheid. And when we get away from that, we get away from the reality of this situation. And so it's important that we need action. Too often we're enamored by the intellectualization of Palestine. Yes, education is important. Yes, we need to document human rights uh, abuses, but we don't need 10 more Amnesty International reports. We don't need 10 more human rights reports. We don't need 10 more Goldstone reports. What we need to do is say 1,400 people were massacred in Gaza over 22 days. What we can say is they've used Hellfire missiles, white phosphorus, cluster bombs, all paid for by the United States to the tune of $3.1 billion a year. We can see the United States vetoing resolutions at the UN. The question is, what are we going to do about it? Yes, we need to educate ourselves, but we need to act against the oppression we see, and that action is boycott, divestment, and sanctions. To speak specifically about the cultural boycott movement, we've had a lot of successes. We've had the cancellation of Elvis Costello, of Gil Scott Heron, of the Claxons, of the Pixies, of Faithless, of Vanessa Paradis, um, and it's extended to the uh, the film community as well. And if if how many people laughed at PACB and other organizations when they talked about cultural boycott? You're never gonna get people to, to sign on. This isn't gonna have a reverberating impact. This isn't gonna have a domino effect. And yet, the, that is the case. If you look at cultural boycott, it has had success after success after success. There's barely a day or a week that goes by where there isn't another one. <laughs> Lastly, I, I wanna say, uh, it's important for us to engage. I mean, I, I work with US ACPI, the US Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott, and we're always looking for more activists, for more students and community members uh, to help out regarding cultural and academic work. And, uh, but the point is, is no matter what group we're working with, we can all do something from groups writing letters to artists to doing Facebook and Twitter campaigns to working on your campus with flash mobs and mock checkpoints um, to leafleting. The, the, the reality is, is that we shouldn't limit ourselves to listening to speakers or limiting to artists or reading books. We have to be part of the movement ourselves. Um, and every single, you know, and I don't mean this in a silly or cliche way, like every single person that it, whenever, because I sit in the audience a lot, every single person in the audience is as important as the person that sits at that panel. What is great to me about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement is that it is very decentralized in the sense that there aren't authorities saying, come follow us, we're the Pied Piper and we're gonna lead you to victory. But there are people standing up across the globe being led, yes, by the call from Palestinian civil society, but by their own conscience to say that we don't just need five leaders, we need five million. Um, so to quote Martin Luther King, freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor, it must be demanded by the oppressed. Boycott, divestment and sanctions is the way forward and the time is now. I'm here to talk about the um, U.S. campaign for an academic and cultural boycott of Israel. And how many of you already know about this? Because I'm guessing most of you do. Okay, so I won't go over the basics. But basically, um, for those of you who may not remember, this was actually formed in January 2009 during the massacre in Gaza. So while U.S. was, you know, while Israel, uh, with the help of U.S. funding and arms, was raining white phosphorus um, and massacring and slaughtering people locked into this open-air prison, um, a group of scholars in the U.S. decided that it was really overdue and it was about time that we responded to the call by Palestinian scholars and artists who had been calling since 2002 and 2003 actually for an academic and cultural boycott. And then in 2004, when PACB, the Palestinian Academic and Cultural Boycott Campaign, was formed, um, many European, Scandinavian, Western European countries had already started their actions for academic and cultural boycott. Um, but the US had actually not. We had not, in a coordinated, official way, responded to the call for PACB for particularly an academic boycott, even though they had been actions. So in January 2009, we decided to throw down the gauntlet. And we decided to say, we are going to have an academic and cultural boycott of Israel in the US, and we are now doing it. And that was the way it started. We just decided the time is now. We actually have to call on American academics, scholars, and cultural workers to stop supporting ethnic cleansing and genocide of Palestinians. And so one of the 
things that we encountered, of course, when we did this, because you know, people in Palestine as well thought that this might not happen for a long time, that you know, they had been waiting for an American campaign and it had not taken place. Um, and we all know the reasons why, I don't need to tell you all, um, but I think we found, of course, that there was a lot of resistance to academic and cultural boycott that we didn't necessarily find in the case of divestment. And I'm gonna talk a little today because you all are here part of the movement um, to understand why that is and what is the work that we need to do to counter that, but why I think that's a productive side of resistance actually that we should harness in understanding where we are in the movement today. I think the reason there is so much resistance to academic and cultural boycott is because it goes to the heart of the problem. I think this is the crux of the Palestine question. It gets to the issue of racism that is at the core of Zionism, and that is a difficult thing for a lot of people to confront. So I think what is at stake with academic and cultural boycott, and particularly academic boycott, because when you're talking about the academy, you're talking about the legitimacy of a nation that sees itself as being civilized, as being modern, as being rational, right, as being democratic. And so I think the difficulty that we had organizing um, around the academic and cultural boycott in the US helped us realize that people are forced to confront not just the economic apparatus of the colonial state, right? Not just the issue of you know the checkpoints and the economy and the infrastructure that needs to be dismantled. It's about the legitimacy of the state's logic um, of settler colonialism and apartheid. And actually getting to that question, which I think people have been trying to get at for a very long time. I mean, apartheid is not a new framework, but I think many, um, you know, sort of detractors have pointed out that in fact um, the question is this issue of legitimacy, and I think this is why the BDS movement is considered a strategic threat, and I think the Zionists themselves are acknowledging that. And so the the question for me is really one of. Um, confronting the way in which settler colonialism constantly needs to be legitimized um, because it is fundamentally a racial system of dispossession where the indigenous people need to be cleansed and displaced to make way for the settlers, as it is in this country, as it is in the US, which is, of course, clearly that connection. So the settler colonial state constantly has to be maintained by ever more militarized and violent forms of domination because there is no way to maintain that system otherwise unless it's by brute force. But it needs to also be supported by a cultural logic of legitimization um, to uh, justify these systems of segregation and to suppress indigenous resistance as in the case of South Africa, or as Desmond Tutu said it's at Archbishop um, Tutu that it's even worse in South Africa. So this notion that there's a chosen people who have the right to displace the indigenous people and who then act as if they were the indigenous people, right? I mean, so that is the kind of inversion of settler colonialism is, I think, what the academic and cultural boycott challenges because it gets to that question of the legitimate right of these people to displace, to eliminate, um, and to destroy another people and their way of life. And so this is why I think we have encountered the most hostile resistance from people who otherwise actually sometimes do support divestment. It's very interesting the kinds of counter arguments we got, which was you know, this attempt not just to divide the movement, but to shield, I think as Remy's saying, that core logic of Zionism. And so f to many people who said to us, you know, just focus on divestment or just focus on economic boycott, you know, why must you actually um, challenge um, this? I think um, academic and cultural boycott is one prong of this larger movement and we need to keep pushing it um, because we see that the legitimacy of Israel is really crumbling, this exceptional impunity as Re uh, Remy says and this idea that they are the only democracy um, in the Middle East. And I'm gonna come back to that. But in 2009, there was actually a Zionist political science professor who's co-founder of the International Advisory Board for Academic Freedom, and he issued this wonderful statement that we have on our website. He says, we have to be careful not to over-exaggerate on this, but we also have to be careful not to ignore it. It is a festering wound. He was talking about us. There were at that time 15 scholars in California mainly who started the academic boycott. It is a festering wound and it needs to be countered not ignored. The danger is not these 15. The danger is if U.S. ACPI becomes 500. So in September 2010 we did become 500. We became 540. <laughs> um, 
And we also had 160 cultural workers who signed on. And you know, in my view, this is not a lot. I think this is a victory. This is great. We are now a strategic threat. In fact, the Royd Institute said the BDS movement was an existential threat. So I think one of the things to think about um, is um, this idea uh, that we, we should uh, understand that sometimes we, when we succeed, it's when our enemy actually uses our language. This is something that I think about a lot, that we have forced Zionists to talk about BDS. BDS is now in their lexicon. They are forced to respond to us. This is also a victory because it's about reframing the terms of the struggle. And so for um, US ACPI, you know, we've actually really had to think of what kinds of strategies we could use given this enormous challenge and the massive resistance in the US um, and to our organizing. And one of the issues that we've really um, uh, had to um, struggle with is the fear in the academy of taking a stance on Zionism. And this is why I wanted to know how many of you are students or how many of you work in a university. Because there's a great deal of caution and anxiety amongst American academics and scholars about using the Z word. They don't want to use the P word, but they also definitely don't want to use the Z word. And people don't want to talk about the Palestine issue until they get tenure, and they especially don't want to talk about it through the frame of Zionism. And so this is a big issue for us. This is why we're only at 540, because people don't want to endorse until they get tenure. Even when they get tenure, sometimes they're hesitant about taking this on. And I think it is that culture of the academy that we also have to shift. And I think this is, in this, we're doing a service to the US Academy, in my view. So where are we right now, and what are some of the future issues and challenges? Um, we're trying to form local chapters. Um, and the idea is that we don't want to be a top-down campaign, OK? So we are not here to sort of tell people, these are your marching orders, and we want everyone to take our brand and kind of you know export it in different places. But we do want to coordinate with people. We want to hear about campaigns in your community, on your campus, find out if you need our support, if we can help you publicize it. We have a huge email list. We also have um, a newsletter. Um, I have some copies over here, uh, which talks about the many different kinds of campaigns that um, are feeding into our work and that we're also trying to support. Um, and we want to actually have affiliate members as well. So even if you don't have time you know, to be working um, on this 24-7, you know, um, we'd love to have people in different parts of the country, especially the Midwest and the East Coast, actually, because of the way we performed are very heavy in California. Um, so just to wrap up, I mean, I think Dalia actually alluded to this, is that the victory of the BDS movement, as I see it, it I think it is a victory, um, as Remy pointed out, is that we've also provoked a massive backlash. So of course, they're throwing money, they're throwing propaganda, they're throwing PR, trying to delegitimize this movement and to shift attention away from these ongoing massacres that are happening in Gaza again and also the issues of displacement in East Jerusalem and also the context of the Arab revolutions because I think this is deeply humiliating and anxiety provoking for a state that you know suggested that it was the only democracy in the Middle East and guess what, there are all these revolutions that are actually calling for true democracy and it's really destabilizing their Role. So there's, I think, a defensiveness and desperation clearly um, on the part of the Zionist state. And so we need to um, really, I think, have a stronger strategic vision. We have to be very tight. And so my um, call, I just want to end with this, is that I think we need to be more united. I think we need to be more coordinated. I think we need to allow spaces of autonomy and grassroots um, organic action. But I think it would really help um, if we started thinking long term in terms of this is what we want to do this year, this is what we want to do the second year. boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns on Israel modeled on those that were used to help end apartheid in South Africa. Until Israel uh, respects international law and Palestinian human rights and meets three specific conditions. The first is an end to the uh, occupation and colonization of all Arab land occupied in 1967 and dismantling of the apartheid wall that Israel has been building since 2004. Second, to, uh, to, uh, rest, to, to guarantee the uh, equal rights and end all forms of discrimination against Palestinians in Israel, so-called Palestinian citizens of Israel or 1948 Palest Palestinians. And number three, to respect uh, uh, promote and implement 
the rights of Palestinian refugees, including uh, the right of return. So those three demands of the BDS movement address all of the segments of the Palestinian people, those in the 1967 occupied territories, the West Bank and Gaza, those inside Israel, and those in the diaspora. The first point I want to make uh, about the power of BDS is its power to unify us and to unify all Palestinians. And uh, Reem Banna also talked last night about how Palestinians have been broken up into different segments, those in, inside 1948, those in Gaza, those in the West Bank, those in Nablus, those in Bethlehem, uh, those in Chicago, or those in, in London. And so we really need to think of ourselves, imagine ourselves as a single community and to act as a single community. So the BDS call provides a platform, I think, for real unity. And this is important in the context of the latest headlines of a so-called reconciliation deal between Hamas and Fatah. And they're calling this unity. Uh, I don't think of that as unity. Uh, what, what did they agree to? They haven't even shown us a document. What's their platform? How does it serve the Palestinian people? How does it serve the refugees? How does it serve Palestinians in Galilee? How does it serve Palestinians in the Naqab, in the Negev, who are being uh, pushed off their land? That's not the unity that we're interested in, a unity between factions so they can share seats in a government that has no power to protect or serve or advance the rights of Palestinians. A real unity is based on a platform that addresses the rights of all Palestinians wherever they are and provides a mechanism to struggle for those rights. And that's what the BDS platform does. Boycott, divestment, and sanctions are strategies and tools. But the goal, the outcomes that we're looking for are the ones stated in the 2005 call. A restoration of actual Palestinian rights now, one point, many of you know me as, as someone who's written for many years supporting a single state, a, a one state solution. The BDS call doesn't specify whether it should be one state or two states or ten states. It says that we must have all of these rights in any solution, whether it's a it's hundred states or one. And that's important, that's very important because uh, a one-state solution in which Palestinians remain an underclass would not be a solution. Nor would a two-state solution in which Israel remains a racist state and Palestinians are living in a little uh, uh, Bantistan. So it brings the focus back to rights. And that too is the power of BDS. It takes away, uh, it allows us to focus on what's real and not to be distracted by uh, peace talks between Hamas and Fatah or peace talks between Abbas and Netanyahu. We bring the focus back to what's real and what will make a difference in Palestinian lives. The second uh, way in which BDS is powerful is its ability to mobilize solidarity around the world. And we've already seen that. We've heard some of the incredible examples of that going on here in California and in the United States. And the battle that was fought at UC Berkeley, uh, although the BDS motion was uh, overturned, uh, I don't see it as a defeat because, as Sunaina said, it forced the Zionists to expand enormous resources to talk about our agenda. And they were on the defensive. And they retain a lot of residual power and inertia, which they're deploying now uh, with all its might to try to push us back. But they are on the defensive. I, I think, uh, again, the point that were made by some of my co-panelists about, you know, when the BDS movement started in 2005 or, or when it, it, the, the BDS call was issued, people thought, well, this will never take off, you know. I mean, this is just such a long shot. And we've already heard how this is now the main existential threat as perceived by 
uh, the Zionist community. In fact, the Jewish federations a few months ago um, uh, launched a multi-million dollar initiative to fight against uh, BDS. Let me close with the final point I, I want to make about the BDS call and uh, th the vision that it lays out. And this connects to the, the points I was uh, making before. That um, I think the difference now between us and Zionists, and I think this is really why I'm so optimistic that we are going to see the dramatic changes in the next few years if we work at it, is that we have a vision we can put forward a positive vision that is based on universal values without betraying any Palestinian rights. We can put forward a universal vision. Our vision is rooted in one that, that views all human beings as equal. Their vision is rooted in one that sees some human beings as garbage. Palestinians in Gaza are garbage. Palestinians in the refugee camps in Lebanon are garbage. Palestinians in Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan and in Nazareth are garbage. Palestinians in, in, uh, in uh, Jaffa are garbage. These are, these are, this is human refuse that's in the way of our vision. And that is, a division, that is a vision, or a nightmare, I can say, that cannot be defended in the 21st century. This isn't the 1950s in Alabama. It's not the 1960s in South Africa. It's the 21st century. And in the context of the Arab revolutions, we don't know yet. I mean, every day brings horrifying news and news that lifts the heart. And the changes that are to come I think are still much greater than the changes we've seen, and our movement is very much on the forefront of that. Thank you.